All right. Dakota Lindworm's done interviews with Sidious Mac through the lap count newsletter with Mac Fleet for the victory lap. And now finally we get her on as a guest on the Sidious Mag podcast to recap her experience at the Olympic marathon, finishing in 12th place in 226. Um, Dakota, first off, congratulations on that. And then, of course, the engagement that followed immediately after. So tons of things to celebrate over the last week or so. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, talk about like every great thing happening in one day. <laughs> it, was, it was just the best day ever. August 11th will definitely go down in history for me. Yeah. So let's, I guess, start with um, the goal setting that got you to to the Olympics, because sort of, you know, for you, celebrating making the team to a lot of people was a surprise. And then from there, you kind of reiterated like, no, like, I'm actually like, one of the best American marathoners right now. And you've backed that up sort of even with this performance, but a bunch of the races in between as well, that for you, you came into this race with an A, B, and C goal of, you know, medal was the A goal. B was, I'm trying to think, uh, make sure I get this right. B was top 10. It was, yeah. And then C goal, what was the C goal? is always just to finish a marathon <laughs> it's there you such go. A brutal distance especially in Paris so I mean that's always that's always a win in a marathon. yeah so how did we go about setting those as your goals you know at what point in the training block for uh Paris did that start to come into the picture of thinking about a medal you know, I think right away, you don't go to the Olympics to be like, oh, I'm just happy to be here, in my opinion. That's not the type of person I am, not the type of athlete I am. Uh, look at Molly in 2021. Nobody probably said she was going to win a medal, but you never know what's going to happen, especially in a marathon. I think us marathoners have a lot of room for dreaming because you just don't know what's going to happen on the day. You don't know how... Um, how well people are prepared. You don't know how the course is going to, you know, affect them. So I don't know. I'm just a dreamer that way. And honestly, my Olympic trials build had gone so well that I, I really felt like I was in even better shape than I proved on that day. So yeah, I mean, nobody really sees the work that's done um, unless you follow me on Strava. And even then you don't really see it all. So uh, I just felt like I was really fit. Sidious Mag paid you a visit um, at some point during the build, and we've got a YouTube video up from, you know, your training during that. But what were some of the things in training that were different for Paris compared to the Olympic trials build? Two very different courses. Yeah, everybody kept asking, like, how this build was in comparison to the trials, and it's it's almost impossible to compare them because – we were doing so much more on hills only that like, obviously things weren't nearly as fast, but I also was like way stronger. Um, we'd do like mile repeats where one would be flat and then one would be up and then down a hill. Um, so, you know, that, that hilly part was like 20 seconds slower than I would normally run, but felt really strong on those. And then I was getting in the gym one more day a week than I normally do. And I think that made a huge, huge difference. I've, I'm super lucky, or we are with Minnesota Distance Elite to have specific strength training coaches, because before I had them, I would just walk into a gym and just be like, Oh, pick up a weight and I'll set it down. And that seems like a good lift to me. Um, but I was doing a ton of sled pushing and pulls. And I think that really, really prepared me for the hills. Yeah. Okay. So the sled pushing and pulling is obviously something that's come about like in the Instagram captions where you credited so much of that to, you know, how you were able to tackle some of these Hills. What do you remember about sort of like the first session where you guys implemented just like the sled training where, you know, it, it, it was, it in general has been interesting to hear from all of the American marathoners as to just the different ways that they approach it. Connor going up and down or parallel to like a, uh, I think it was like a ski uh, resort or something like that, just to kind of get that incline. But for you, I guess, when you guys set up the sled training, I guess, what was the intent there? Well, so especially with like the the push, you know, you're holding onto the bars and your body is close to parallel with the ground. And that's super similar to how you're going up that hill. Um and the first time we did it, I like could hardly walk the next day. And I was like, Jim, my, that's my strength coach. I was like, I don't know about this. This is insane. But like, it slowly got easier and easier. And I was feeling stronger and stronger. And 
obviously it worked and that's why he's got a degree in it and I don't. <laughs> so it's all about like trusting that process and stuff. But I've, I've started to learn that. I think there's so much value in getting in the gym as a marathoner. I think, you know, we hear from some athletes who are like getting in the gym, like no way. And um, I think that's what like a place where I personally can gain a lot of um, strength and get a lot faster through. So then I guess as training progresses, you know, a couple of weeks out, you know, as the taper starts to settle in, how are you sort of like mentally locking into the idea of going to the Olympics? You were at opening ceremonies, which I thought was just an interesting choice because so many people would opt not to do it, you know, especially when the marathon is, is so late. So you, you, you went in on the celebration stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really wanted to take part in opening ceremonies, number one, because it was a little bit different of an opening ceremonies where we weren't stuck in a stadium where we couldn't go to the bathroom or drink water. We were on a boat. They gave us snacks, water. Um, you know, I got to hang out with Anthony Edwards. <laughs> this is pretty sick. Um, and like 2028 is not promised to anybody. So I, I really intend to be back, but just in case I don't want to ever look back and tell you know my kids someday like oh yeah I didn't participate in it and I wish I had or whatever so um I don't know and then I was like why not just be in Paris for three weeks what an amazing way to acclimate I'll get to eat great food eat a lot of croissants like everything there's no it's all upside there's no downside to being in Paris aside from the running is not super great uh but we found we made do we found a way to make it work how much of the course did you see beforehand uh, I saw basically like that 15k through, um, you know, 35k going when we went in April, um, Puma brought us out for the Paris marathon. Um, so Fiona and I, and then a few of the male marathoners all got to run that once. And it put the fear God in me, um, to be a hundred percent honest with you. <laughs> yeah. And it does it like, it didn't get any less scary. I feel like even though so Connor and Clayton, they did go and run like 13 miles of it, I think the week before. And they're like, oh, it's not that bad. But for you, none of that ever dissipated. No. And I heard them. I talked to them and they said that. And I was like, you guys are so psychotic. But for me, if my I want my expectations to meet reality, I guess, if if I go into it and I say, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And then I get there and I'm like, oh, it's bad. That's an issue for me. So I'd rather go into it and pretend like I'm going up Everest and then get there and be like, oh, it's it's not as bad as I thought it was. So for me, I think it's a mind game. <laughs> yeah. Um, really quick, going back to opening ceremony is the interaction with Anthony Edwards. How did that come about? I mean, for you as a Minnesota, you know, sports fan, that must have been it, how did you approach going up to like the biggest star in the NBA? <laughs> oh my gosh. So he walked right past me and I was like, you don't be that girl D don't be the don't you be the have super to be. fan and I let him get a few steps ahead of me and I was like if I don't I'm gonna regret this for so long so then I went up and I was like yo Anthony like I went to I went to like eight games I saw all the playoffs it was such a fun season and he he kind of hit me on the arm he goes wait wait till next season it's gonna be even better <laughs> and I was trying to get the courage to ask for a selfie so I grabbed my phone and I didn't even really have to ask he was like let's do it let's do it and he like put his arm around me and I was shook for like three hours after I couldn't even like catch my breath um he is just as cool in person as you think he would be which um I think is super awesome because he easily could have been like get out of here <laughs> like I don't know who you are but I like, explained to him I was a Minnesotan and a big fan so it was it was super cool and after that I was like you know we're teammates yeah it's not like he's on a whole different level on a very real way like we are we are the same right in this moment yeah so i guess help dispel any of this like belief that i guess a lot of people would have they'd just think like oh lebron and like the rest of these nba players are on the boat and they're just like off to the side or they've got security like everyone was pretty intermingled i mean the videos coming out of that day were pretty funny it was like table tennis players interacting with some of the nba players like so I guess, were there any other sports that you st struck up a friendship with? Um, I met and talked to some people in sailing, which okay. was just a lot to learn about. Um, and uh, like skateboarding was another one. Cause like the, that's so out of my realm, but yeah, we were all, it felt like we were all equals, which was super, super cool. And I got to talk to some of the sprinters um, that I've never really met. 
and I had they like introduced themselves and I'm like no 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 I know who you are you won't know You're like I'm no Lyles it's like I know who you are <laughs> yeah yeah I've heard of you <laughs> but yeah it was super cool I felt like we were all just like one big family and it was just so many at different types of athletes walks of life it was awesome so all right then days are leading into now at that point it's like once that's kind of done you've got a long time to wait until your actual race at the same time team usa starts crushing it on the track how much of that was motivating for you getting ready for your own race yeah it was such a bummer that those races were so late because like the first night um grant fisher i stayed up for it and i shouldn't have because then when he meddled, I was just, I literally was like jumping around our Airbnb and I was just wired for so long. And it set such a great tone that I was like, I've got to watch all these races. And it felt like night after night, distance was just showing up. And I felt like it was just setting the tone for everybody else. Um, it was so much fun. I got to go to the hundred meter final for women's. Um, that was the only night I physically like went and watched. But after that, I was just trying to, you know, stay healthy, not get sick. There were so many people in Paris. I was worried about it. Um, but yeah, I was staying up most nights to watch the races because they were too good. They made them too good. <laughs> Connor was saying how his goal was to get to bed at like 7 p.m. And I was like, you know, that's when the evening session started. Like there's, it's gotta be so hard to fall asleep and then wake up to the news. It's like, oh, Ry Benjamin won gold last night. It's like, I wish I would have watched that in per like either in person or, or stayed up for it. <laughs> Right. The thing for me was like, I a couple times tried to just go to bed and be like, I'm not going to think about the three case people tonight or whatever it was. And I would just end up staying up and then checking my phone anyway. So like, I'm just going to, I'll just sit on the couch and watch it. And then I can like experience it. It's a once in a lifetime thing. And um, I mean, man, I'm having like the post Olympic sadness too. Cause I'm like, what are we watching at night? What are we, what are we gonna, what are we streaming right now? <laughs> I know I found myself going back and like rewatching a bunch of the stuff because it's like one, it was cool to watch in person and in the stadium, but then, you know, you kind of want to go back, hear the TV commentary, see how it all unfolded, go back and watch it all over again. And so, um, yeah, no, the post Olympic come down is for sure for real, but I mean, they've done a good job of just putting everything up online afterwards. Um, so day before the race, Take me through sort of like the feelings. Is it nerves? Is it excitement? A combination of both? Yeah. So I got up early so that I could watch the men's race. I, was, I felt so lucky that women were second for a lot of reasons, but mostly so that we could see how the men's race played out. Um, I watched the men's race with my family um, and our Airbnb and immediately called Coach Londo. And I was like, we got to talk. This did not play out how I expected. And I think we've got to like re-go through a game plan here. Um, so I was really nervous for like a couple of hours right after the marathon. And then I sat down with coach and we talked it through and I was like, okay, no, I'm good again. I'm good. And then as the day went on, I like slowly got more and more nervous. I honestly kind of felt like the first time I was running a marathon all over again. Um, I feel like I've gotten really good about kind of keeping the nerves aside, just being like, it's any other race, whatever. But that day before was really hard for me. Um, I mean, it's super fun. That's why you do it is because like you get such a high off of those nerves. But uh, I definitely was freaking out a little bit. <laughs> what was the original game plan before the quick pivot? Because I everyone expected the race to be slower, like even... Clayton and Connor thought 208 would win or medal, and that was not the case. Yeah, so originally it was just going to be like, you know, cover the move, stay with the pack, don't do not do anything um, out of the ordinary, just stay hidden, kind of like what I did at the trials. I kind of said, like, I'm going to be unseen, unheard, and then be a factor when it means when it's time. But because it went out and it was – it was such a fast day. We decided leaving it to the end wouldn't be the right move just to go run my race. Um, especially because it seemed like over the last 15, 20 K, there wasn't a lot of mix up. Um, it kind of, kind of set in stone once they got to that final hill, like that was going to kind of be how the race ended. So, um, the biggest thing was just running my own race and not not letting it get super slow he gave me permission if it was slower than like 5 30 pace which is 
impossible math with kilometers. <laughs> um, That's right. There were no mile markers on no this course. No mile marks. <laughs> No, um, no kindness to us Americans, but that's okay. Uh, he gave me permission to just take it and um, just get comfortable in my own pace because I, I definitely don't run as well when it's kind of like more of that fart like style, which is why you saw me for a little bit go to the front. Um, it wasn't because I was like putting a surge thinking I was going to outkick these women or like uh, run away from them in any way. I was just running consistent and they were running back and forth. It honestly, like looking at the names on paper was one of the most loaded marathons in history. Like you could look at this and be like, wow, this would break any major's budget to try and hit all these appearance fees for these stars. When you have, you know, Tigas Asefa, the world record holder, Sifan Hassan, Helen O'Beary in there. When you discuss sort of covering moves, like I know in the past, just sort of with, especially with the trials, like those moves are just covering like someone's pace. You know, if someone throws in a surge here or there less, so it, well at the trials, maybe it was reactive to, Hey, it's this person. Like if you see Kira D'Amato move to the front, like you go with her or, or whoever it might be um, just because you know, those Americans so much better. How different was that approach when it came to the Olympic marathon where, yeah, I mean, Tigas has a 211 PR on paper and Safan is 213. Like covering their moves is a whole different sort of ball game. But, you know, how did you kind of, was it just sort of looking at locking into a certain pace or how did you, I guess, look at, look at your competitors there? Yeah, I really tried to not look at my competitors. Obviously, I know who they all are. Yeah. And I, you know, it felt very David versus Goliath. Like these are amazing, amazing women who have done such incredible things that I can only dream of right now. So I just didn't want to be, um, I didn't want to be belittling myself, being like, oh, they're so much better than me. I didn't want to set a ceiling on myself and say like, oh, I can't, I can't cover the moves they make. Um, of course, I know when they were making moves, they meant it. Like, it's not like, in, like you said, in Olympic trials where, of course, like I know Kira D'Amato means it, but there are some people who might make a move where you're like, that's not real. Yeah. <laughs> like you are playing cards you don't have there. And um, I knew that every single thing that they did, they they meant. And, um, but I just, like I said, I didn't want to put any limit on myself. And then even in the end, I ended up coming back to beat uh, Perez Jepchatur, like, and I never would have said on paper, like I, I should be able to beat her, but by just like not thinking about it like that way you can. All right. So I did take a dive into your uh, recap on Instagram. And so we'll kind of walk through that as the race unfolded. So I even remember, cause in the, the people's marathon that I ran the night before, there were some pretty sharp turns like at the very beginning. And like, if it was crowded, like people were just fighting over the tangents and you experienced the same thing early on. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, congrats on your finish. Oh, thank uh, you. I important. almost didn't finish, but it, but you did. it was a hard course to drop out on. <laughs> you know what? I think we all almost didn't finish in some way, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, those, I was just talking to my dad about this. I almost feel like they should have ran it in reverse or something. Cause it, it was so chaotic. Um, at that point, it was so narrow where I feel like it was, it was too many turns and too narrow for that many women to be together. And there were like three turns right in a row where I was like, Oh, I'm going down for sure. I'm going to fall. And so many of these women have been on the track and they they're comfortable with that push and that shove. And I'm, you're like, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, I came straight out of college and went right to the marathon where we all love each other. It's kumbaya in the beginning and we're all like, oh, let's all be friends. So to get like, I got shoved in the back because I'm sure somebody was falling behind me. Um, and I was like, I can't do this. It's kind of taking a lot out of me energy wise, like mentally. So I ended up, I didn't like move to the front completely, but I did go to the near the front. So I could be like, I want to take my own path, my own tangent and not worry about these people pushing me and shoving me. And I'm so much smaller than a lot of people, like height wise, I was almost getting elbows to the face and stuff, so. Oh my gosh. Uh, Sifan Hassan obviously had just run on the track. Like she's she's someone who like typically sits in the back of a pack and eventually works her way toward the front. I mean, did you notice her? She goes on to win the whole thing, but in the early miles, I mean, were you thinking of, Hey, you know, this woman has a 5k, two rounds of the 5k and a 10k in her legs. And here she is. 
you know, I, uh, I hate, I hate that I'm even going to admit this, but I did joke with my dad because my, my dad doesn't know marathoning all that well, but he knows it a little bit. And I explained to him that what Stefan was doing. And I was like, so if there's one person I'm going to beat, it's got to be her. And then jokes on me, nobody can beat her. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was, I was definitely looking for her because in my head, um, it's kind of like when, um, you know, like Helen O'Beary's in a New York City marathon. That's a girl you look for. What is she doing? Like, what is, you know, there's, she's such a smart racer that I was, I kept kind of looking for her and being like, where's she at? How is she looking? Um, whatever she's doing, I kind of want to do. All right. So the pace starts to hit like a little bit of a fart lick type of approach there. And then you just decide, all right, like I've got to stick to my pace plan. What, what happens there? Yeah, we were not quite to 15. We were between 10 and 15 K and I had been towards the front and there were, I think like a few, maybe Australian girls ahead of me. I haven't went back to rewatch the race yet, but all of a sudden Perez passes me with like breakneck speed. It was like, whoosh, like somebody drove past, like I was running a marathon. She was running a 400. I was like, what is going on? I know I can't do that. Um, that is so outside of my wheelhouse. And so I was like, oh, whatever. Um, it's still so early. We have all the hills to cover. And they dropped me like a bad habit. And all of a sudden, I couldn't even really see them. Um, I heard be from other people. I got it like uh, 30 seconds. They had like 30 seconds on me. And I was, and I felt it. I was like, oh, gosh, should I let the race just go away from me already? Um, but I just was staying consistent, kind of running like 530-ish. Um, in kilometers whatever that means and uh uh just slowly started working my way back up because as soon as they hit that long grindy hill it seemed like they slowed down quite a bit and so I was kind of going up it and my my tactic is I don't look up on a hill I don't want to know how much more there is I keep my eyes down and all of a sudden I like looked up and I was like oh they're literally right there and that was like a nice um dopamine rush because I was like okay I can reconnect I can get back with them and eventually did yeah, because that first hill on the course, I think, goes to, like, what, 21K or something like that? It's, like, around that 13-mile mark. And mm -hmm. then it's soon after that that, like, you not only just catch the pack, the photo that you posted on your Instagram by 23K, you're leading the whole race. Like, what did that feel like? You're leading the Olympic marathon. I I said it in a, a quote earlier, but it was, like, I took a Mario Kart shortcut. I, was, I like, looked back a little bit, which I don't normally do. I was like, what just happened? How did I get here? And I just kind of laughed to myself because in no way did I think I'd be, like, taking it out like that. Um, it was super cool, and I, I swear I could hear all of Minnesota, like, cheer for me all at once. I We had a whole theater here filled with people. Um, so it's like, you know... I'm not doing this to be showboaty. I'm not doing this to like get my 15 minutes of fame, but I'm glad that the people at home are probably wired right now. <laughs> One thing I love about just most of the running photos that people have taken of you during a marathon is you're all smiles, like most of the time. And there's like that famous quote, I think by like Elliot Kipchoge, where it's like, you know, he smiles like to essentially like, you know, when it's getting hard and it's painful, like the smiling helps. What is smiling do for you during a marathon? Because it 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 looks like you're having the time of your life. <laughs> I mean, truly I am. Even in the worst parts, even the darkest moments of a marathon, I enjoy it. You know, we're all, if you run a marathon, you've got something messed up. You love to hurt in some way, I think. But the first time I ran a marathon at grandma's, um, a road marathon, I guess, I was going through one of those dark moments and my dad happened to be there and I, I kind of gave him, I gave him a smile and like, you know, like a strong arm and it immediately like pulled me out of it. So it's exactly what Kipchoge talks about. It like snaps me out of like bad thoughts. It forces me to be happy. Um, and I, I love when I can hear like, oh, look at how good she looks or she's smiling. That's awesome. And I hope that like one person sees it and it's like, if, if an elite marathoner can have fun while doing this, maybe I can. And hopefully it inspires them to, number one, have fun during their marathons, or maybe number two, sign up for their first marathon. So leading the Olympic marathon obviously leads to a little bit of like an adrenaline rush. And you don't want to let that take control and take over to the point where it's like now you're just like stepping on the gas a little bit too much. At what point did you start to think, all right, like let's reel this in. And the pack does catch you at some point but you know I guess mentally reeling it back while letting the excitement just kind of take over a little bit that must have been hard 
yeah because I definitely had that moment of like holy crap like I am doing something so it's not like leading the Boston Marathon or the New York City Marathon I'm leading the pinnacle of my career marathon um but yeah I immediately just tried to like take that deep breath um relax I, this is like marathon number 15 for me so I've, I've had those moments of being too high too soon and having to pull it back and um, I just kept checking my watch, making sure I was within range, make sure my heart rate wasn't too high. And I was kind of checking those boxes. So I just kept on keeping on. And yeah, eventually they they came and passed me again. I was kind of, I was, I was feeling like pretty rough at that point. We climbed some hills already. Um, and in my head, I was like, the same thing's going to happen. When they pass me, they're going to get to the wall. So they call it. Um, and I'm going to catch them there. And of course, that never happened. And I think that's what I look back at with the most regret is saying like, oh, I, I should have at least tried to close that gap a little bit uh, as they passed me. But, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty. <laughs> In that moment when you're leading the race, like, is there even like the 1% like thought like I could win? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, the whole race is like, I could win. You know, you don't know what's <laughs> happening. Even when you're getting passed, you don't know what's going to happen to them at 20 or what happens to them going down the hill. Um I think uh, we have to be delusional in some way um, do, to keep yeah. going. <laughs> All right, so let's get to the hill at 30K. It is just like the TV broadcast doesn't even do it justice of like being able to see what it actually looks like. It is just a straight up hand, extend your hands. You're touching the ground ahead of you. Scariest hill I think I've ever seen. Um, I walked it. And I'm not ashamed to say it. you said you almost did. Connor said the same exact thing, like in your in his in your Instagram caption. And when when I chatted with him last week, uh, but you didn't bring yourself to to walk. Right. So I, I can't remember what book it is. It might be Born to Run uh, where they talk about there are some hills that are worth walking up versus running. And in that moment, I was kind of weighing it as like trying to convince myself it was a hill worth walking up, but I was like, I can't walk in the Olympic marathon. Um, I love that you ran it too, because there's just no description to properly define that hill. Um, and like you said, I, the broadcast looks scary, but it still isn't scary enough. Um, but yeah, I just immediately thought of Jim, my strength coach, who would just, when my um, cadence would slow down, pulling those uh, sleds, he'd start to yell at me like, hit, hit, hit. And I was just telling myself, hit, 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 um, trying to get up it as fast as I could. And then once I crested it, I was like, you know what? The race is basically over. Like I've done the worst part of this race and it's all down. It's literally all downhill from here. What are you seeing around you? Like I know for me, there was a ton of people walking, but like, where the, did you see anyone else? I, I, did you pass any people on the hill? I closed, um, quite a big gap on the hill. Nobody walked up it. Um, yeah. but it seemed like I was I was catching the two girls I could see ahead of me. What are you thinking when you look down at your watch and you see either the effort, the heart rate, and like just the pace has or the pace has slowed down even for like the smallest moment. It looks like a normal person's uh, marathon <laughs> pace. I uh, I purposely didn't look down because I oh, know smart. I should I should go and look and see what like my slowest moment was because I'm sure it's like a seven well, it's probably like an easy run mile for me there you know it's probably pretty slow that afternoon so before I ran I went and looked at Connor and Clayton's Strava and for them there was a point where Clayton and Connor's you know they were at like 740 pace or something oh like yeah maybe I'm at like nine minute pace I could easily <laughs> do that um it, it felt so slow um I'm trying to in some ways you have to like flush some of that stuff down the drain because it, it hurt so bad and it was so scary that you can't you can't hold on to it forever <laughs> I'm holding on to it for as long as I can. Like I've gone for a couple easy runs in Central Park now and I look at Harlem Hill. I'm like, this is not a hill. Like, and it just like warped my entire thinking of, of hills from now on. I'm going to hopefully let that continue for as long as possible because it really was something that like you have to experience for yourself to get a real understanding of just how traumatic it was. That's so true. I do think, you know, like going forward, I'm going to look at hilly marathons and be like, <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah we'll talk new york um once we get through this because i'm sure now the thinking has kind of changed a little bit um so the hard part of this hill is not just the climb but it is like the descent on the other side 
people around me were just like letting their legs go and just like essentially falling down the hill. And I said to myself, I was like, that's not, you can't do that this early. Like there's still 10 K plus to go that you're going to pay the price for it. What was your strategy on the downhill side? Because even Clayton and Connor have said that like the depressing part to it is that like the hill did sort of essentially decide the finishing order of the race. And there's only so much you can do after that, where maybe they were able to catch one or two guys, but it splintered the race in a way that like, Hey, everyone's places were decided already. Yeah. Yeah. So I had actually missed my 30 K bottle, which is at the top of that grueling hill. Oh my gosh. And so I was like pretty rattled, um, going down that hill, my calf started to cramp. And I was like, it's because I missed my bottle and I was just kind of spiraling. So I, I had a pretty tough time down like the first half of that hill because I, I would consider myself an incredibly strong downhill runner, but I couldn't like let my foot land the way it would want to naturally because every time I did it, my calf would kind of go like, ooh, like, like seize up just a little bit. So I was kind of running wonky, but I finally let it, you know, it kind of like worked itself out, thank God. And um then was able to kind of stride down it more normally. But yeah, like you said, at that point, it was like the, the race was pretty decided. I did go back and forth with a few women, um, but it, you know, it was like kind of like I'd pass a girl and then a pet girl would pass me. So it, it really was decided by that point. And man, did that, I mean, I went for my first run today, literally over a week later, and my quads still feel like they did at that point. <laughs> it oh my really, gosh. It, my quads are still really beat up from it. Wow. Um, strategy wise, like I've seen a couple videos that like Amy Yoder Begley has like, you know, posted of just sort of the bottles and like the cooling. How did you, what, what were you holding on to? I guess in, in both of them, like, what was your strategy to cool off? Cause it was really warm. It was so, um, big shout out to Connor and Clayton. Cause I feel like those guys thought of quite literally everything. They're like, they did all the thinking so us ladies didn't have to they came up with that water bottle idea or water balloon idea where they froze them and then stuck them to their water bottles because cooling the palms of your hand is so important so they um came up with that so i was doing that also i love to hold like onto wet sponges and then anytime there were ice bags i was taking it and putting it down my sports bra or just holding the ice for as long as possible Wow. I didn't, I didn't catch on to the, the water bottle thing. I mean, the, the water balloon thing, but yeah, oh, it, yeah. it was, it was interesting. Cause it's like you, the course I got, well, at least like the one at night, like didn't really have a whole lot to to offer to people. It's not like your major marathon where like every mile there's something up, you know, for, for people to have that. Yeah. I mean, str strategically, like cooling down is also just another element that you have to add this thinking to throughout the whole entire thing. Totally. And I'm, I'm pretty, I don't know if it's lucky or if I've worked hard at being like this, but, uh, I, I like warmer marathons. I think I survived them a little bit better. People complained about Orlando being hot and I was like, oh, it's just like any other day in Florida. And I kind of felt that way about Paris too, but I'm really good at, about grabbing ice every time I sauna quite a bit. So I, I always felt really prepared and I never felt like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm dying of heat. All right. Then we get to around 35 K and you shared the story about this boy who was cheering his head off for you and running alongside of you. What was happening in that moment? Oh, I I'm literally going to tear up again. I've talked about this a million times, but it was such a special moment for me. He, we came off that hill and I was kind of in a bad spot because it, I could just tell like it, it didn't seem like a lot of women were coming back to me. I felt like it was pretty decided and I knew I wasn't in the top 10 or I assumed I wasn't. Uh, and all of a sudden he just, he came up along the, the fencing and he was like, go Dakota. And I, it, it was so loud and so enthusiastic. It like, I had to like, look, and he was running with me. And I gave him like a little smile and away. I kept going. And then like, it felt like 15, 20 seconds later, he was still cheering for me. And I was like, yeah, I like, I started getting pumped up for him. I'm like, heck yeah, dude, you're fast. Um, and he was holding an American flag, like a, a cape. It was so, so cool. Um, and then of course, like Runner's World posted that thing, like help find this boy. And I've since connected with his family. His name is Jackson. And um, I couldn't meet with him after the race, but uh, you know, planned to, he actually lives in New York. So I'm hoping maybe this fall I'll be able to meet up with him, but 
I'm sending him a little care package because he's just the greatest little kid ever. That was so inspiring for me. And it, it turns out that he's listened to like all my podcasts. Like he's just a really big fan of me. And I'm like, that's so cool. I am um, just so blessed that he was there when I needed him. Uh, he helped me get to that race for sure. Oh my God. That's awesome. Because especially like the point of the race that he met you at, like it was when you needed him the most. I know. I It's honestly such a blessing and gosh, he just deserves so much praise because he was just so awesome. And honestly, like I was still running like five thirties. This kid had to have kept up with me for like 30 seconds. I was like, most adult men can't do this. So super awesome for him. This guy's fit and he's uh, going to be going for a spot in like 2032, I bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remember the name for sure. Yeah. Um, all right. So then in the last you know, uh, I guess like from there, less than 10K to go with the places somewhat decided, like what do you hope to accomplish there if you reel in one other person? But is there an, a, a part of you also that's like, all right, like let's enjoy this, like and, and soak in the fact that you're at the Olympics? Totally. Like, you know, I was disappointed not being within the top 10, but also I knew I was running a really great race. I wasn't blowing up. I felt like I was getting faster. And I don't know where it is in the race, but you come, you go under an underpass and you come out and all of a sudden the Eiffel Tower is literally right there. And it, it gives, it gives me chills now. It was like, wow, like I'm here. I'm almost done with <laughs> this absolute mountain race. And I'm about to be able to call myself an Olympian for the, the rest of my life. And the crowds at that point were insane. They had to have been like six people deep. My very top, my like six foot cousin had my dad on his shoulders and I never even saw him because it was like so loud and so overwhelming. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of go up and around the Eiffel Tower and this is so shocking. I need to put a PSA out there. I've for my whole life known a marathon is 26.2 miles and I'm thinking to myself, a marathon is then 42 kilometers but you'd be wrong. It is 42.1 kilometers. And I was so surprised when I got to 42 K and I wasn't done and I couldn't even see the finish line. I, I did not know that a marathon was longer than 42 kilometers. So I learned a life lesson and, uh, now I know. <laughs> I had the same thinking too, because I thought I was like, wait a second, the Eiffel Tower is right there. I, we finished at the Eiffel Tower, right? And it was like, <laughs> nope, we still got a ways to go after this. And then even in that finish area, that point one in that 42 was like that winding part where, you know, if, if people watched on the actual broadcast, it's essentially where Tigas Asefa threw Hassan, Sifan Hassan into the wall. Like there was, it was, it was crazy. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's one of those moments where it's like, I still have so much to learn about this sport, I guess. <laughs> I, I thought it was 42 kilometers flat, but that was around the time that I, I passed Perez and, also the time that I was like, you have so much to be proud of. Cause if this course could beat her up, like it's, it's a worthy course and it's finishing this strong is something to be proud of. When you cross the finish line, I guess at that point, did you know that it was 12th? Like, had you already counted ahead of time or, or did someone have to tell you what place it was? Somebody had to tell me, I, they did kind of have like a leaderboard. So I, okay. I saw a 10th go by and then I think an NBC button person told me that I was 12th um I knew I wasn't in the top 10 for sure so that part was hard but like also I just became an Olympian for the rest of my life so it's like this roller coaster of like oh I wish I had done just slightly better but also it's still amazing and at the end of the day like if I'm ever completely satisfied with the race that'll be the day I re retire I'm always going to finish wishing I had done a little better yeah I mean I it that's how you ended the Instagram recap where you're just like um if the race was a mile or two longer, I could have closed, but if I'd been in the top 10, I would have been, you know, pining for a goal for a medal. If I had won gold, I would have wished I'd won by a bigger margin. And that's the beauty of, of this sport. We're always striving for more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why we're seeing so many records being broken where we're all just wanting more from ourselves. And I think that, I think it's so beautiful because we're just never satisfied. So we're, we're always just striving for more. When, it, this always gets me when I watch like the uh, finish of like these major marathons and the people who particularly win are just like celebrating. They get the flag, they're running up and down. Then I always just think about like, all right, you know, the pain is going to hit you very soon. And, you know, that's just how any marathon goes. 
soon after you exit, you know, the park in New York City, like, and you have to face, you know, the bus or the subway stairs or the hotel stairs, like, that's when you like actually feel the pain. When did this, when did the quad issues and the pain from this race start to to hit you? Because in the video you posted, you know, where eventually you get proposed to, like, you're already walking a little funny. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. I would actually, I feel like every time I've run a marathon, the recovery process has gotten better and better. The first time I finished a marathon, it was like, oh my God, I might not ever walk again. And then come to like the Olympic trials or Chicago, I, I felt really fine the next day. Um, but this one was almost like starting all over again, where it was, it really beat me up. I'd spent a long time where I felt like I needed help out of bed the next day or like tying my shoes or picking something off the ground. Felt like it, I might die if I had to do it. Um, yeah, it, it immediately was pretty painful for sure. All right. Then the proposal happens. Tell me a story. Do you have any idea this is going to happen? I had no idea it was going to happen. I had dropped hundreds of hints that I wanted it to happen. Some subtle, some not so subtle. Um, but he had done a really good job of uh, hiding it, I guess, or making me believe there was just no chance that it was ever going to happen. And only three people knew, not even anybody in his family, my dad, my aunt, who is basically my mom at this point. And then our, we have like a camera guy who's been following me around the last couple years. Uh, they're the only three who knew. So it was a surprise to very many people. <laughs> the video that, who got the video that was posted? Because like, it, there's so many people around and apparently like the, the commentary, like I guess from just the people in the background is also really funny. Like <laughs> so many people, you know, had this spurred on them as well. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was uh, his sister-in-law, was recording it. I think maybe he asked her to. Um, and then, yeah, there was some guy waiting to see Safan, I think, who's the funny commentary, who's like, it's a proposal, it's a proposal. <laughs> She's like, yes. And it's, it's all so funny because also like Dorian is there from New York Roadrunners. MK is there from Boston, um, Montana's whole family, some friends. Uh, it felt like such an eclectic group of people and it was, it was really awesome to share it with them. All right. So then after this, you know, how do you go about celebrating all of it? The, the engagement, the, the race, like what was the, what was the plan immediately after you get through the mix zone and, and everything after that? Yeah, we had a ton of people from Minnesota distance elite out, um, almost like our whole board. And so we went kind of close to like where the Olympic village is at. And rent, like, we just kind of hung out at this, it, they called it the communal. It's like a big, uh, almost cafeteria, I guess. And just celebrated for the night. I was absolutely wiped. I think I got up at like three in the morning. So it wasn't like some crazy party or anything, but just got to celebrate with all the people who uh, support me every single day. And like my team, Minnesota Distance Elite has been so awesome and needs so much more love than they've been getting. So it was super fun to to spend that time with them. And, you know, of course, with my family after I just gotten engaged. Uh, really quick on Minnesota Distance Elite, like I've, if, you, if people follow them on Instagram over the last couple of days, just announcing like a bunch of new additions. So in addition to, you know, your success, what's got you mo like more excited about like you know, having more training partners and more people, you know, coming to train with you guys, because obviously, you know, you got everything's working. Yeah. So I always give, I have to give so much credit also to Annie Frisbee. She, when she joined, she was just a force to be reckoned with. And during workouts, she was just whooping me every single day. And it really forced me to get on a new level. So I'm super excited to get back to practice now with some of these newbies, the fresh blood, <laughs> they're going to, they're going to come out and they're going to challenge me. And when we have these women who all have different strengths, like Annie on the track, is just like, hold on for dear life every time. Um, and, you know, when then we get to the long runs and she kind of does the same thing for me. She just tries to hold on to me. I think that there's so much value in that, like having different strengths, because it forces us all to get better in the areas that we need to. And being surrounded by women who just all have the same goal, like being at the very best, being the best in America, it, you know, rising waters floats all boats. And uh, where we've got a lot of people on MDE who, who want to be the best. All right. So when are you expected back 
at practice because you've got another race on the horizon just announced you're part of the new york city marathon elite field why sign up for another marathon so soon after the olympics yeah i for the last two years have been doing three marathons a year and it seems to work for me i i'll never be a girl who goes back to the track uh and nothing excites me the way a marathon does new york road runners treats their athletes so well it's hard to say no to them <laughs> you know you go there and you're treated like a lebron james or an anthony edwards so um it's just really hard to say no and i didn't do so great there in 2022 and i am there for redemption for sure and then after being 12th at the olympics i'm like i can dream like i i think i could be top three in new york um especially because it's run so championship style. I don't think that there's any reason I can't hang with some of those women. So I am, uh, I'm really excited to get back out there, get back to marathon training. And Paris is so hilly that New York is going to seem like a Chicago. <laughs> I was literally going to bring that up right before, you know, we decided to record this podcast. We were both just on a little press conference call, you know, with the rest of the elites taking place. And I asked sort of like on a scale of one to 10, what would you grade Paris? And then what does that mean for the hardest parts of the New York City Marathon? And Tamarat Tola took the question, the Olympic champion, you know, Olympic course record holder. And he said, I think it was that New York is a 10 out of difficulty. And immediately I was just like, what? And then he goes, and then Paris is an eight. Even his coach checked him being like, are you sure about that? And I kind of saw everyone else's reaction on the call where I was like, there's no, like, what? And Helen O'Beary disagreed, said that she thinks, I think the Paris course was a little bit, is tougher than New York, but they're bo both very different. You know, they, they play out in a different way. Like in Paris, of course, the last 10 K flattens out. And like we've said, like you can just roll and the places are already there in the last five, 10 K of New York. Like that's when it gets most interesting and the race really sort of begins. And so the hills at the end of Central Park maybe might be more challenging because of where they come on the course. What did you sort of make of, I, I, it's, it is tough to compare the two, but in a way, like, I feel like you don't look at the Queensboro bridge now thinking like, oh, this is, this is going to be hard. Yeah, when he said that, like, I think you could have seen the whites of my eyes. I was like, yeah. are you sure? Uh, I disagree, um, politely, but <laughs> but he is the champion, so I, I don't know if I'm allowed to. But yeah, I think just the, the grade of the hills in Paris, and then that last downhill is so steep that it leaves just nothing left in your quads, where I don't feel like you get that in, in New York. Um, of course, yeah, it's going to be a little bit tougher at the back end of New York, but I, I like that because it does shake things up. Um, but I certainly think New York is easier than the Paris course, which is really exciting because, you know, who knows hope, if I can run a 226 in Paris, hopefully I can run, you know, a 224, 223 in New York. Yeah. I mean, we obviously saw how well Molly ran at the 2021 Olympics and then came back to run New York City that fall. And so like the blueprint is there that like you can be successful in that short of a turnaround of sorts. Um, and similarly, like, I guess like in the last two years or so, because the American records have like traded hands so much with, you know, Emily and, and Kira and, um, just in general, like seeing the, you know, Emma Bates when fully healthy is someone who believes that she can go out and get that. I feel like even after this performance in Paris, does your mind also go to that place too, thinking that down the road putting you on a flat, fast course, whether it's Valencia or whatever it might be, that you could be one of those people who goes after the American record. Totally. The The last two builds have just gone so well where I'm able to finish like marathon efforts or marathon pace things like around 515, 518 and feel really comfortable. I think once I can uh, have the, the time to do a flatter course that I think I don't know, I could be a factor. And that's also part of that delusion that I have where why, why not me? Why why can't I be an American record holder? Why can't I do something really great in this sport? Um, but yeah, I'm def I definitely dream about that. And I'm excited for Chicago this year because it could definitely fall and be set even higher. And 
I love that because it, it makes us strive for more. All right. So final thing is if we are establishing early, of course, like with, you know, months to go, A, B, and C goals for the New York City Marathon, you floated the idea, A goal would be podium or win. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what would be B and C? B would be top 10. I have yet to be in the top 10 at a world major. I think I've been like 11th or 12th in Boston a couple of times. Uh, and then C is always just a finish. It's, it's brutal out there. You never know what type of day it's going to be. So it's always a win to finish a marathon. Awesome. Well, Dakota, I appreciate you taking the time to reflect and recap the Olympic marathon and looking forward to seeing you here in New York. And then when afterwards we can talk about it, just how easy that race was compared to Paris. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait for that moment. <laughs>